Hello and welcome to another edition of Sree's Sunday New York Times Read Along. Our guest today is Amy Vership, travel editor for the New York Times. This Sunday's paper features a special section, Summer of Cycling. In the host chair again is Sri Srinivasan. He'll be the managing director for ASU's Cronkite School of Journalism's Cronkite Pro starting July 1. That's a new gig for him. And he's of course the co-founder of Digimentors, our digital and virtual events consultancy. My name is Neil Parik. I'm the executive producer of Sri's Sunday New York Times Read Along. In addition to talking about summer of cycling, we'll of course talk about the shooting in Ovalde, Texas, uh, and uh, we'll be covering New York Times for kids as well. But before we uh, go any further, let's take a look at the teaser video to give you an overall sense of what we'll be covering. This week on Sree's Sunday New York Times Read Along, our guest is Amy Vership, travel editor for the New York Times. This Sunday's paper features a special section, Summer of Cycling, which includes seven great biking cities and which trails to ride, On the Water's Edge, Vancouver by Bike by Timothy Taylor, E-Bike Bliss on Two Hawaiian Islands by Tim Neville, From Italy to Croatia on Two Wheels by Alex Cravar, In Northern Vermont, Trying to Smooth the Ride for Mountain Biking by Heather Hansman, Eight Rails to Trails Adventures in the U.S. by Lauren Sloss, Measuring Family Milestones Beneath America's Tallest Peak by Carolyn Van Hammert, and The Gear You Need to Hit the Road or Bike Trail by Stephanie Pearson. This is Amy's second appearance on the New York Times Read Along. She and Sebastian Modak were our guests in January 2020 on the release of that year's 52 Places to Go. We will also, of course, review the latest on the horrific school shooting in Ovalde, Texas. Sri has been hosting the New York Times Read Along for six and a half years with some amazing guests. The show is produced by Digimentors. We produce high quality virtual and hybrid events for organizations big and small around the world. We also do social and digital consulting, training, and workshops. Sri Srinivasan is our host. I am the executive producer and occasional guest host, Neil Parek. Paula Kiger helps produce the show, engaging with the audience on Facebook and LinkedIn. Again, Amy Vership is our guest, live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimentors website. That gives you a sense of what to expect in today's show. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us, uh, especially thank you to everyone f- watching on Amy's Twitter account. Uh, we're so thrilled to be uh, live with you today. A few quick uh, uh, guests who are joining us, Jonathan Borstein uh, from the East Village. Jonathan, hope you're doing well. Uh, Want to make sure you knew you had our best wishes. Patricia Freudenberg watching from New York. Doug Levy watching from um, uh, California, uh, from the San Francisco Bay early as always. Pradnya Haldapur from Brooklyn, New York this time, not in the DMV. Congratulations on the family wedding, Pradnya. Ron Thomas, our friend, watching from Dubai. Bob Veritoni, watching from New Jersey. Hi, Mom. Uh, And I know that uh, my mom is making a comment about the uh, uh, shooting in Ovalde. uh, And of course, we will be talking about that. There's a special poem that Amanda Gorman wrote that Sri will be sharing in just a bit. Um, Patricia says, welcome back to Amy, our guest. Miles Rose is watching from San Juan. Miles, thank you. Uh, and, uh, Jonathan says, uh, yes, he recovered. Uh, he had a procedure in the hospital. So we're so glad that you're doing better, Jonathan. With that, uh, I want to bring on Sri Srinivasan. Um, Sri, good to see you. It's been a while. 
It has. It's been two months since I've been in the guest in the host chair. You've been <laughs> a fabulous guest host. It's like uh, the way that you've been able to make sure that we're on the air every week. It's been so great to watch you and Paula and the team pull the show together. We're very, very grateful uh, to you, Neil and Paula, for what you're doing. And hello to everyone. I am so happy to be with all of you and uh, to talk about uh, print, to talk about newspapers, to talk about the news. There's so much to get through. We do this every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. And you saw our friend Bob Le uh, uh, Doug Levy is watching, uh, even though it's 5.30 in the morning out in California. Uh, please tell us where you're watching from. Please tell us your take on the news articles we read and just how you're feeling today. Uh, especially those of you who have been following the terrible stories out of America about uh, the shootings. I know this is a very difficult week. And at the same time, we're thinking of everyone in Ukraine with everything that's happening there. Ken says, good morning from Iowa, my friends. Good morning, Ken. Thank you. We'll say hello to our special guest, uh, Amy Vershop, who will be with us in just a few minutes. Before that, we want to give you a quick look at the newspaper and uh, just get you ready to have Amy with us, the travel editor of the New York Times. We have so much to talk about and to share with all of you. And what I want to do first is just give you a sense of where I am on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. You can see downtown New York all the way in the distance. And you can see the Hudson River and New Jersey across the way. I thought I'd start today with reading a poem from yesterday's newspaper. This is Amanda Gorman's haunting new poem about the shootings. It's short, and I think it really sets the mood and helps us frame what's happening in America in a way that is uh, really special. So this is a uh, illustration by Angie Wong here, and it's called Him for the Hurting by Amanda Gorman. Everything hurts. Our hearts shattered and strange, minds made muddy and mute. We carry tragedy terrifying and true, and yet none of it is new. We knew it as home, as horror, as heritage. Even our children cannot be children, cannot be. Everything hurts. It's a hard time to be alive and even harder to stay that way. We're burdened to live out these days, while at the same time blessed to outlive them. This alarm is how we know we must be altered, that we must defer or die, that we must triumph or try. Thus, while hate cannot be terminated, it can be transformed into a love that lets us live. May we not grieve, may we not just grieve, but give. May we not just ache, but act. May, we, may our signed right to bear arms never blind our sight from shared harm. May we choose our children over chaos. May another innocent never be lost. Maybe everything hurts. Our hearts shadowed and strange, but only when everything hurts, may everything change. Amanda is a poet and the author of The Hill We Climb, Call Us What We Carry, and Change Sings. This is in yesterday's New York Times, a really moving poem that I wanted to make sure we started our show with today. I know how unhappy and upset so many of us are at the moment, and it feels like nothing will change. And that really started with Sandy Hook when toddlers were gunned down and nothing changed. And here we are 10 years later, and it feels like nothing will change. I'm holding out hope that maybe something can be done even as Americans, a vast majority of Americans, are in favor of common sense gun laws, things are very difficult to change. So we will reflect on the news, we'll cover, we'll see how it's been covered by the New York Times, and so much more in the next 90 minutes. We'll be joined in just a few minutes by Amy Vership, the travel editor of the New York Times. I thought we would start uh, uh, looking at the different sections of the paper so that you get a sense of what's in the paper. And this is actually Saturday's front page. Just wanted you to see this headline. Please send the police now, she pleaded. This was uh, about a caller 
uh, who uh, called in, as you know, the police were there and did nothing. And they could have and they did nothing. Really, really sad. This was yesterday's front page. This is today's front page of the New York Times. And 1,500 dead since 2009. Can U.S. do something about mass shootings? Rifle maker known for pushing limits. Ideas for gun laws have little reach. Uh, this is the, the, the lead story here. And uh, one life stolen, a whole family shattered. Buffalo massacre had many victims. We don't want to forget what happened in Buffalo just a week earlier. We'll come back to this as we read this with Amy in just a bit. Uh, the cover of the arts section, uh, Soprano frees himself from limits. Manuel's Marin Samuel Marino, who grew up with bullying, says he's still working toward self-respect. Uh, the real estate cover is uh, apartment hunting diaries. It's never been easy, but soaring prices make finding a place in the city feel impossible. Uh, the arts and leisure cover from today, anointed as the king, Austin Butler plays Elvis. He's the next big star in American movies. And uh, really upsetting magazine cover story, which many of you may have read online already, the anti-vaccine movement's new frontier. A wave of parents radicalized by COVID-era misinformation reject ordinary childhood immunizations with potentially lethal consequences, not just for their children, but for the population at large. Look at this Sunday Review cover. Authorities said the gunman was able to obtain the weapons legally. This is in Uvalde. Buffalo, Boulder, Atlanta, Dayton, El Paso. These are all legally uh, legally uh, purchased weapons. So upsetting. Jay Caspian Kang on the unbearable familiarity of Uvalde and Nick Kristoff on new approaches to gun control. Uh, all in this and Michelle Cotley on the NRA celebration in Texas. Let's go over here. Uh, the this is the special section that we'll be talking to Amy about. This is uh, called the Summer of Cycling, and we're very exciting to talk about this. As travel returns, this is the season to grab a bike and explore, whether in the city or the country, by yourself or with friends and family. And the special kids section of the New York Times, this is all pr uh, print only edition, but we want to let you know that our friends at the New York Times have agreed to let us post the PDF on our website, digimentors.group, digimentors.group. Uh, you'll be able to find it there till noon Eastern time. So for the next three hours or so. So if you have any friends who have children uh, who would love to read this section but can't get it because it's a print only edition, it's available in PDF with permission from the editors uh, if, till noon Eastern today. So if you're watching this live, please go to digimentors.group and uh, check it out. And our book review is... Uh, we're looking at here, Ghost of a Chance, Ali Smith's new novel, companion piece, is set in a pandemic-ravaged post-Brexit Britain with a perplexing choice at its center. The Metropolitan cover is Here Comes Summer. Uh, cooling off isn't equal. And this is an example of a story about how much more attention is being paid across the country on equity issues. And the business covers growers are turning more and more to workers on seasonal visas and mechanizing where they can. Meanwhile, labor-intensive crops are shifting south of the border. And uh, this was, sorry, that was yesterday's Sunday cover, uh, but sorry, business cover, this is today's. If it's too crowded, will nobody go there? As if the city depends on Times Square income, but the more visitors flock to the area, the more off-putting office workers find it. This has been true for many years, but obviously it's coming to a head now. And finally, the Sunday Styles cover is Maureen Dowd talks to Ted Sar Sarandos, who is the CEO and co-founder of Netflix about the stock drop backing Dave Chappelle and Netflix's biggest test yet. You may remember that they lost about 200,000 subscribers, um, net subscribers, uh, the first quarter. So we'll be reading all of these sections and looking at them and uh, spending lots of time on this particular section. But now I would like to bring on stage our friend, Amy Vershop, who is going to be talking to us about all sorts of things at the New York Times and travel and where we are. Uh, Amy is a travel editor, and this Sunday's paper, as you saw, features a special section, Summer of Cycling. 
Let's say hi to Amy. Hi, Sri. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you so much for being with us on Memorial Day weekend, the start of summer, the time when people are thinking a lot about travel. So it's perfect time for you to be here as travel editor of the New York Times. We last had you on the show when Neil got to visit your home and read the 52 places to go for 2020 uh, with Sebastian Modak, who had done the previous year's places to go. And it was, of course, surreal that that year was the time that everything shut down after that and travel uh, has gone through so many changes. And even now we just see the stories about Delta cutting 100 flights a day because of the mask mandates being canceled. So we have a lot to talk about. Thank you very much. I always start the show by asking our guests about how you are and how you've uh, weathered the pandemic. Uh, you know, uh, like everybody else, I think right now I'm um, saddened by what's going on, both in Buffalo and, and Uvalde, as, as well as, you know, here on this, excuse me, holiday weekend, um, you know, starting my summer. So it's kind of a, a bittersweet weekend, I think, this year. Um, but, I, you know, in terms of weathering the pandemic, I personally, you know, I, I think like everybody else, I've just been slogging along and, it, you know, I think we keep thinking it's ebbing and over and it keeps reminding us that the virus will decide when it's going to be over. So, um, but just doing the best we can. Yeah, I, I think that's how we're all feeling about this. Uh, tell us what's happening at the Times in terms of back to work and where things are and what's been, have you been going in at all? Talk about that, please. Um, I do go in. So uh, the Times has been, um, in what was termed the encouragement phase of trying to get people back in the office. Um, you know, I know we have a, a piece about Times Square and how, you know, workers have been hesitant to go back. And I think that's true of New York Times workers as well. Um, but, and we recently, we were supposed to move into a new phase where people were, um, you know, expected to be back in the office. Um, but now we've kind of put that on pause because there were growing numbers in New York. So we're still kind of in the encouragement phase. I go in a couple times a week um, and, uh, you know, it takes some getting used to, getting used to commuting again and all those kinds of things. But it's been fine and there's a lot going on in our office. Um, we've had the Pulitzers. We've had uh, Dean Becquet and Joe Kahn, you know, Dean Becquet is stepping down as the uh, executive editor. Joe Kahn is coming in. Um, so a lot's been going on and it's been good to see people again um, and connect with them again in the office. So I'm just thinking of the wording. So it was uh, it was the encouragement phase and yes. now the expected phase. And that's been put on on pause, as you were saying. Yes. And, yeah. And, and you know, we also, since it's been two years since we had you, we should acknowledge the incredible work the Times has done these two years covering the pandemic and every aspect of it. And I still remember that very powerful cover when it said 100,000 people had died, you know, uh, and, and now we are at a million. And how has the Times coverage, as you've seen it, evolved in that, in that period? Um, well, you know, at the beginning, of course, we were in, um, you know, in crisis mode, really, right? So it was the dominant story um, for a really long time. And we were really, um, you know, I think people were so creative about trying to come up with ways to cover it. Our graphics people have done an incredible job with maps and, and, and tracking of how the virus has uh, proceeded through the country. Um, at this point, you know, I think just as the virus has become a, a bit more of everyone's life uh, and normal life, I hate, I'm putting normal in quotes because I, I hate to say that, but I think it has, you know, we're still very aggressively covering it, but it's not necessarily the number one story anymore. Um, and I, you know, for travel, we are, have been trying to figure out how we move into a more, um, you know, a, a, a pre-pandemic coverage or more, again, quote unquote, normal kind of coverage about, you know, places for people to go while also not forgetting um, that the virus is still here and there's still so many issues for so many people with the virus. And in fact, 
in addition to our special section, we had a big news story this weekend or, um, about the virus, which is about people uh, kind of circumventing the rules to um, come home to the United States even without a positive, uh, without a negative uh, test, which you're supposed to have to fly into the U.S. Uh, actually, you know, I, I didn't know that people were able to do that. I had to, I was just returning in the last two months. I've returned from India to the U.S. and from Italy to the U.S. And there's that scramble where you have to go find this test. And, yeah. and, the, and it's a real pity if people are uh, circumventing that. And on, on the plane, the, on the Emirates flight back, they did encourage everybody to wear a mask. But obviously, in large parts of Europe and in America, people are not wearing masks. Can you talk a little bit about the business side of this for travel? Uh, I mentioned the Delta uh, crisis or where they've announced this. I'm sure a lot of airlines are going to have this problem of staff shortages not being able to cover all the travel, especially the summer travel. Yeah, no, we're, you know, last summer was we uh, termed it and many people did like a summer of hell. Um, and I think we're going to see, I don't know if it's going to be quite as bad because I'm not sure that the, um, you know, whether as many people will be getting sick because so many people have already been sick, but um, there's definitely going to be a lot of uh, the, the possibility for delays, for canceled flights, that kinds of things as the airlines try to deal with increased demand at the same time that they're still trying to staff up. Um, I mean, I think one of the things um, with Delta uh, canceling flights is that they're trying to get ahead of it. But one of the, um, you know, and cancel them ahead of time rather than canceling on people like on the day of their flight and other airlines have done the same thing. Um, you know, and one of the things that's also different this summer is that flights are much, much more expensive. Um, last summer, the, you know, demand was still not where it had been like in 2019. So flights were fairly cheap. Uh, you could definitely find deals. Trying to find deals this summer is extremely difficult um, because demand is high, the number of flights is more limited, and they're really, you know, they have no reason to make your flight cheap. Yeah, that, that's a, a great analysis from the travel editor of the New York Times. Folks, this is Amy Vership. We're talking about travel and so much more. Uh, we are give, getting a, a, a sense of what the summer is going to be like. And so I'm going to ask you for a tip here, what should people who haven't made their plans yet be thinking? Will it get better in August? Will it be worse by then? What, what would your advice be? And I'm sure being the traveler of the New York Times, people are always asking you for these tips. Yeah, I mean, I would say if you um, if you don't have to fly in the travel in the beginning part of the summer um, and you haven't made your plans, wait until a bit later in the summer because mm -hmm. A lot of places, uh, school goes back in mid-August, um, so those families are kind of, you know, off the table in terms of traveling, so the demand eases a little bit. You know, that's traditional, and like traditionally, of course, September, which is a great month to travel, um, is uh, the, the demand goes down. One of the things we're trying to track is, you know, as people now can do work from anywhere, um, whether that will hold hold true or not, or whether demand will stay high through September as people, uh, more people who don't have children, who don't have to be in the office, um, decide to use that time. Um, and the whole, you know, the whole work from anywhere thing has kind of changed the demand because people can go and, you know, be someplace beautiful and work from there. I did it myself, so um, I know how appealing it is. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, and you can, uh, we'll be doing pieces along these lines in the coming days and weeks. Um, think about alternate destinations. Like if you have your heart set on Paris, Paris is going to be, you know, the flights are going to be very expensive. Might be a little cheaper to go to Quebec. It's not Paris, but it's certainly <laughs> beautiful and you can use your French. So like think about alternate destinations and places that uh, might scratch that itch, but are not quite as popular. I saw that Airbnb redid its interface in part because they said that people were going to the same few places 
and they are trying to give you, encourage you to think about, as you're saying, alternative destinations uh, as well. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the tr about, about the travel coverage of the Times. How has that evolved since uh, the start of the pandemic, and what is the future of travel coverage? Um, well, you know, starting in March 2020, we really shifted away from our what we call destination coverage. So not so many pieces saying this, you know, travel to X, Y, or Z place and here's what to do and it's beautiful and here's the experience you can have. Um, and we shifted much, much more into doing news, which was really important for people and doing service, answering their questions. How could they deal with the new world of travel? You know, in the beginning, it was very much how safe are you when you travel? It was about refunds because people, you know, so many people either decided to cancel their plans or their, their trips were canceled for them, um, how to deal with closed borders, all those kinds of things. Um, we stopped doing, say, our 36 hours column because we really didn't think there was a, you know, people couldn't go. So it seemed uh, that we shouldn't do that kind of coverage. We instead instituted something that's been really, really popular and people really love, which is our World Through a Lens, which is a weekly photo essay in which we use photographs uh, that have been shot by um, photographers um, that give you a, a, a view into a part of the world and into a culture um, that you might not know about and kind of try and bring the world to our readers. And that really started at a time when the, our readers could not go to the world. Um, and people really have loved that. And we've done some really beautiful work there. Um, and now we're kind of shifting back and, and as I say, trying to do more destination stuff. We've started a series of pieces about what's new in various cities. You haven't been to, um, you know, Chicago or Miami or Rome in a couple of years. What can you expect? What's new there? What's exciting there? Um, and we will also uh, in the future be starting 36 hours back up, which I'm really mm -hmm. excited to do. And that's probably coming a little later in the year. Um, so, you know, it's really shifted over time. And you, you as, as the editor have to use different muscles, right? That you, as you're thinking of coverage in new ways and you've all already mentioned so many interesting ways in which you have uh, fulfilled that need that people have to see the travel coverage. Uh, folks, we're talking to Amy Vership. If you have a question for the travel editor of the New York Times, please ask on the platforms. We're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. If you have a friend who loves to travel, please make sure they can watch this, retweet, reshare, or tag a friend right now and they can watch this live or later. This will start up right again on all our platforms as soon as we're off the air with some comments that have come in. I'm just going to read them. Here's James saying, thank you, New York Times. Keep up the wonderful work. That's so nice. So, uh, Apollo is saying, hello from Philadelphia. Hope all are well. And Apollo is a part of our Digimentors team. Miriam says, good morning. Watching from Hell's Kitchen in New York City. And Christopher is watching, and he's on the Upper East Side uh, from Manhattan. Uh, hi, Chris. And Chris it works at the American Folk Art Museum, which is a wonderful small museum in New York. And I'm always telling people to go see this, the, the museums of New York. You know, you don't have to travel the world to see great stuff, especially if you already live in, in New York or around New York City. And so I think that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, we have some comments here. Sujana says, we talked about the pricing, how expensive things have become. And Ron Thomas, who's in Dubai, says, oh my God, the price of tickets are through the roof. My clients are pushing back on picking up travel costs for premium seating. Uh, folks at Ron's level who work around the world are used to, uh, you know, business class tickets and things like that. Um, have you heard about this kind of pushback and, and uh, difference in premium travel as well, Amy? Oh, well, you know, I fly in the back of the plane, so I... <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, I mean, well, one of the things is that business travel has not picked up to the extent that um, leisure travel has. Uh, MasterCard recently did a, a report and they showed that whereas leisure travel really has come back above 2019, business travel is still below 2019. And I think they're, you know, one, I think, 
companies are saying, do you really have to take that flight? And I'm sure that there's pushback on the cost because I mean, the cost even to fly in the back of the plane right now is expensive. So if you're going to be in business or first, it's through the roof. And we know that that's how airlines make their profits are really on those business class tickets. So are they expanding their uh, economy seats? Are they doing more economy premium, premium economy, things like that? Well, you know, if you've flown any time, you know, even before the pandemic, you know that you're going to pay for every tiny bump up that they will give you. So, yes, if you want a better seat in the economy, if you want, you know, check bags or, or you know, like the check bag fee. Uh, I was hoping, you know, one of the things we focused on is whether uh, travel can be done better after the pandemic, you know, whether we learned any lessons. I was kind of hoping some of the fees would go away, but that has not been one of the lessons we've learned. That they have hung on to those fees. Yeah, and they will always do whatever they can to maximize that as any business will. Uh, what is your, you know, as you look ahead, uh, what is what does winter look like? What is the spring or is it just really too early to tell? I think it's too early to tell. I mean, I think, again, you know, sort of every time we thought the virus was on its way out, uh, it has reminded us that it controls the narrative. So um, I do think, you know, right now we're, you know, there has been a surge in cases of these these variants, but I do think it's obviously less deadly than it was, um, uh, you know, with the, the reminder that there are people who are immune compromised and for them it still remains very, very serious. Um, but I do think people now are kind of, you know, I think they've come to the conclusion that they're going to go and do things and that they're going to risk whatever, uh, you know, sickness they might face because they feel like it's not as deadly. Um, you know, the big issue that we see for a lot of people who want to go outside the country is uh, Americans who want to go outside the U.S. is the issue of having to test when you come back. Um, and people, a lot of people really hate this requirement. The travel industry has been lobbying very, very hard to get it taken away. Uh, the government, the feds have made no indication that they are ready to get rid of it. Um, so I think, I think that if and when that goes away, I mean, it will go away at some point. Um, I think that will be a big change for international travel. Um, because I think it is holding back some demand because some people are afraid. I mean, I think people outside the U.S. who, you know, who want to visit us um, are concerned about being able to get in and not having to, you know, cancel their flight if they suddenly test positive. And then I think Americans who have gone abroad uh, are concerned that they're not going to they're going to test positive and that they're going to get stuck somewhere. Um, so, and as I, I mentioned, we actually have a piece this weekend that's um, up on our website about how some people are using what we term a backdoor, which is that if you fly into the United States, you need to um, ha have a negative coronavirus test. If you come across a land border, or in fact, on a ferry, um, you don't. So uh, some people who have tested positive or who don't want to test because they're afraid they're going to test positive will fly to Canada or Mexico and then come across, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a land border and then go on their way from there um, home. So. so that doesn't <clears throat> solve you know, the problem that they're trying to fix with this. As long as the mass mandate is not there on the planes to have this other rule seems antiquated. Uh, a question, you sort of alluded to this, if I had, I arrived on Thursday, on Thursday morning I took a test in, in Italy, if I had tested positive, what, what were my options at that point? What could I have done and what would be expected of me at that moment? So the expect, so the, excuse me, the expectation of you is that you will isolate for 10 days um, and then with a negative test again, be negative and then be able to come back into the United States. The other option is to isolate for 10 days. And if you're still testing positive and have no symptoms, then what you would do is uh, get something called a certificate of recovery in which you get a, a medical uh, 
a, you know, a, a medical specialist to certify that you have had the coronavirus, that you are no longer sick and that you can come back into the country. So you can imagine what that would have been, how expensive that is to get a hotel room in Europe in the summer suddenly for 10 days and what that means. And that I can I can see why people are upset about that. We have so many questions coming in and we also want to read the paper, but we'll just uh, we'll point out a couple of questions here. Patricia is asking, uh, well, what would Amy say is her favorite summer place for traveling? Oh, wow. Uh, you know, I, um, I don't necessarily have a favorite place. I, I love, uh, I'm kind of torn because I love to get outdoors and do things outdoors. And then I also love um, great cities. So, but the one thing I always have to have when I go traveling is a place to go swimming, uh, especially in the summer because I'm a really big swimmer. So like I always kind of like, I loved Stockholm because in Stockholm you can basically dive into like, in the middle of Stockholm, you can dive into the water at any moment, and it's amazing. Um, so wait, wait a minute, that sounds uh, you mean certain times of the year and yes, the yes, yes, yes. Although you know, I, I was in uh, the, the Scandinavians are like a whole other thing. So I was in <laughs> Oslo just before the pandemic, and you know, in Oslo, so I was there in January, and they have um, floating saunas in the fjord in Oslo, right? So you can go out onto one. I didn't do it. I didn't bring a bathing suit. Who brings a bathing suit to Oslo in January, right? But so you go out into the sauna, you get really, really hot. And then in January, you jump into the waters of the fjord. So, <laughs> um, you know, they'll swim at any time. But I was in Stockholm in the summer and you can uh, swim basically anywhere in Stockholm. It's amazing. Amazing. Uh, Linda Bernstein, who is on our DigiMentors team, our VP of Education, watching from the Berkshires, says, I'm not hearing so much about flying and the impact on the environment. Uh, please talk about these two years. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely, you know, when you choose to fly, you are impacting um, global warming. Uh, I mean, as you are when you heat your house and when you drive your car and all those things, like all of our human impact. Um, but you know, there's considerations about flying. During the pandemic, of course, with flying down, the percentage of carbon from uh, travel did go down. Uh, it's obviously going back up. I think when you fly, you need to make choices about where you're going and, um, you know, you can buy carbon offsets, although they are very debated. Um, but if you try and not do short hop flights is one of the things, you know, in Europe, there's actually a movement to ban um, short flights uh, so that, you know, anything under, say, four hours, you would take the train rather than uh, get on, you know, a short hop flight. And I think that's a really good um, lesson that people should take and, and use themselves. So, for example, if you're flying to Paris and then you're going somewhere within France, they have very fast trains in, in France, take a train instead of flying that second leg. Uh, same thing, Spain has really great fast trains, same thing you can do there. Um, you know, and so think about what your impact is. Is there any hope for rail improvements in America as you watch the political climate and budget issues? You know, hard to say, but the, uh, Amtrak is actually opening some new um, routes uh, as tests this summer, which I think are really kind of interesting and see whether we can get back to using rail a bit more. So for example, um, I'm actually up in uh, the Northwest corner of Connecticut and they are going to be running an Amtrak train to Pittsfield, Massachusetts this summer starting, I think it's next week. Um, so you could actually take the train up to the Berkshires. Um, they are expanding service in Vermont uh, so that you go to Burlington on the train. Um, and I'm sure there are other experiments like that around the, the U.S. that I don't know about, but I do know the, um, you know, the Northeast. So I think they're, you know, it's like nibbling around the edges, but uh, I think those are at least interesting experiments. And it's when you go to Europe and you see the wonderful train service that they have, rail service that you realize you know we're in uh, like two different worlds uh when it comes to rail folks it's uh, we've got about another 50 minutes 
uh, with our friend Amy Vershup. We want to tell you about a future guest who's joining us. Amber Williams will be here with us in June. She's the editor of the New York Times Kids section. And uh, today's Kids section is up. It's called The Tiny Issue. And uh, it's a print only edition, but Amber and team have given us permission to post the PDF just for another three, just till noon Eastern on our website, digimentors.group, G R O U P, digimentors.group. Please take a look. Please tell your friends who have kids that they should download the PDF before it disappears. Mm -hmm. This is a really nice thing we're able to do with our friends at the New York Times. So please uh, tell your friends. Uh, who have kids to grab this issue. And uh, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, we are with Amy Vershup. Uh, we are talking about the news as well as the New York Times. And we do this, folks, every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Please tag a friend. Please hit share right now. Uh, please email a friend or text them and tell them to watch us uh, on these platforms and the recording will be available right after. Uh, so Amy, uh, before we move into talking about the rest of the paper uh, and especially the cycling section that we want to get to, uh, what are you, what are you uh, when people come to you and ask you for tips, uh, do they know what it's like to be the travel editor? Do they think you're like flying all over the world in uh, fancy uh, business or first class? Are there some misconceptions about the life of the travel editor? Indeed, there are. I mean, you know, uh, one is, as I said, I fly in the back of the plane. Uh, the Times does not pick up business class travel for me. Um, but um, I think people think I travel more than I do, although I am and both in my personal life and, you know, for work, I do travel and I love to travel. Um, but a lot of what we do is uh, send people. And in fact, a lot of what we do right now is find people in places um, that we want to write about as opposed to sending people. I think, you know, the model um, a long time ago or even, you know, like, let's say 10 years ago was uh, that you would send people always and have them write about where they went. But I think that you do get a more... Um, authentic experience and, and deeper understanding sometimes when you use people who live in a city to tell you about that city or, you know, a rural place. Um, so it, it's kind of a push pull between sometimes you want to have the experience of a person discovering it and you go along on that discovery with them. And sometimes you want to have a person there who really understands a place and who can kind of help explain it to you. Um, I think it, yeah, I think it'd be fair to say that the New York Times used to be all about you know the American sensibility, but now as you're a more international newspaper, having that local uh, experience, I think will be so much uh, will, will be better. Uh, do you get uh, do, do you become more popular among your colleagues because once you got this job, people are like please send me here, please send me there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean we get we get a fair number of people who are like uh, you know I'd like to go here or there who within the paper. I mean, one of the things is we do use uh, people who live there. We use a number of the correspondents, which is always great. Um, you know, we've had uh, Jason Horowitz, who's in Rome and Jeffrey Gettleman, who's been in India, um, write for us fairly before the pandemic, less so now, um, you know, to cover places that they've been. Um, and they have such great insight and, and, you know, do such a wonderful job covering the world that it's always such a wonderful experience to have them in our section. Uh, Linda says that she once wrote a piece for the travel section about um, taking the Amtrak from Florida, uh, from, I mean, to Florida. And uh, Ron, who is used to flying in the front of the plane, says it's easy to get spoiled. But recent trip, he flew JFK Milan on economy. That's how I fly on Emirates and that's the flight I took and it's uh, Emirates is one of the best uh, flights, uh, one of the best airlines for economy in the world. And uh, Patricia asked, did, did you ever work with the food writer for a special edition? You've done, I know, food issues and things like that. Uh -huh. um, I'm, I'm not sure for a special edition we've done uh, work with food writers, but you know, we do have people write about food for us, absolutely. Sure. So tell us about this special section, the summer of cycling. And Neil has a uh, one, the video that was online, and he's going to play that without sound, so you can talk about it as well. 
Uh, yeah, so we decided um, we are, did the special section, which is about um, biking. And one of the things is that during the pandemic, as uh, you may know, we so many people rediscovered biking. You couldn't even buy a bike um, for love or money. Um, and people really discovered the joys of being out there and um, being on two wheels. So we put together this special section. And, and the other thing is that not just for kind of people rediscovered it, like biking around their city, that kind of thing, but also there are a whole bunch of new routes that have been developed, um, either rail trails in the United States or, um, you know, cities have really devoted themselves to uh, creating biking infrastructure. Paris, for example, has seen a really striking um, uh, buildup in its biking infrastructure, uh, as we note there. Um, and um, there's also these routes in Europe called the Eurovelo, um, which take you thousands of miles through Europe and can really explore Europe on a bike. So we wanted to take advantage of all that um, and bring it all together for people. So in this issue, we've done, um, as you see, we have these bike routes um, in, we, we selected uh, cities across the, the world that have some great biking and we suggest a, a bike route in each city. Um, we did Vancouver, I think, as you noted before, uh, Vancouver is a great biking city, and we did uh, a whole piece on how to see the, the city by bike um, going along the seawall. Um, we also have a guide to rail trails in the United States. Um, I'm not see. familiar with that term, rail trail. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's a trade-off. So one of the sad things is that local rail service in the United States has disappeared. But there was all this infrastructure, all these paths that had been created. Um, and so what they have done over the last, the movement really started in the 1980s, but what they've done over that, the, you know, the last 40 years is to take those old railroad right of ways, you pull out the tracks and you turn them into biking paths. Um, and actually where I am here, I'm, uh, as I said, I'm up in the northwest corner of Connecticut. There's a very, very popular trail near me um, in Millerton that goes through Millerton, New York. It goes actually from the end of the train line in Wasaic, um, and it goes all the way up to, now it goes to a place called Bash Bish Falls to Taconic State Park, and you can ride the whole thing, and you're off the road, which is what's really nice. Um, so we highlight some of the great rail trails across uh, the United States. And then we do this piece uh, about the Eurovelo, um, where you, uh, we do a section of the Eurovelo where you can ride from Italy to Croatia, um, a beautiful, beautiful ride that you do in a number of days. Um, and, and I know there's a nice video of this, so let's take a look yes. at that. You gave it a really special treatment. So if yep. you can talk about it as, as we look at the website. So we did this as uh, an, an interactive. Um, and we, you know, we wanted to do one of the pieces um, from the, the special section as an interactive. And we chose this one because it had the uh, combination of a narrative, right? It's got a very clear narrative. You start in Trieste, you end up in Pula. And it had beautiful um, photography, you know, the opportunity for beautiful photography and also the opportunity for video. Um, so we put all those things together and we have this wonderful map which shows the route as you go through, which I just love. Um, and we actually, you know, a lot of times when we write articles, what we do is the writer goes on the journey and then the photographer um, goes separately in the writer's wake. And what we actually did here is the writer had gone on the journey and then to do the photography, the writer and the photographer went together and kind of re recreated his exact steps through a lot of it and caught the beautiful scenery and also some video. I think the next, you scroll down a little bit, I think, is that our video? There's um, some video coming um, of, uh, there we go. Um, that's gonna be video which I think is just so much fun and um, really brings the reader into the experience of the riding. Um, so it, I, I just think this captured the experience really beautifully and is very immersive um, for the reader. That's really powerful stuff. And as you said, the 
the the photography and the video all really work beautifully together and i'm just admiring it on the print page here and obviously it looks like you folks had fun putting this together we did well. i mean maybe we could talk about that for a second kind of the fun that you have when you're working in the travel section um yeah you know like it, it's been a lot of news and service the past couple of years as i said but there's also the fun part, which is to get to bring a beautiful, par beautiful parts of the world to our readers and share with them really great experiences. Um, and so this is one of those chances where it's like, oh, I would love to do this trip. I mean, the, the Vancouver one, if you read it, I, you know, I was reading it going, oh, you know, I really have to go to Vancouver and go biking because <laughs> it sounds so great. Um, and, uh, you know, also the urban biking ones, uh, the other urban biking lines, I'm like, oh, this would be a great route to ride. I, I personally do love to go on, go biking when I go to a new city. I've biked in a lot of places. Um, and I think it's always a fabulous, fabulous way to see a city because it's, a, you know, you, you can see, cover more ground than you can walking. Uh, you can stop when you want to, uh, which you can't do if you're on public transportation or in a cab or anything. And this pace is just wonderful um, for sightseeing and exploring. Yeah, here is the gear you need to hit the road or trail. So yeah. some suggestions um, there. Yep. Yeah. And then this is what you were talking about, the rail tracks where they're Yep, these the are the track. rail trails. Um, yeah. Rail trails, sorry, rail, yep. rail trails, yep. Um, and then children uh, cycling. Yes, yeah, so this is a, a, a personal essay by a writer named Carolyn uh, Van Hemmer, who uh, lives in Alaska and has written for us previously about Alaska. Uh, she's pretty intrepid, <laughs> uh, as you might imagine. She's actually a wildlife biologist as well as a, uh, a travel writer. And um, she goes biking with her family and kind of it's kind of biking as a metaphor for family and watching your children get older and go out on their own, um, try their own, you know, being under their own power after being, uh, you know, so little and, and you're carrying them or in her case, like biking with them. So um, it's really a lovely piece. This is, uh, this tells you I'm not a rural person or an Alaska person with children abroad, nearly rear ending a black bear one day and dodging a rock fall the next, even a hint of one of these things would keep me off the trail and she's doing both. <laughs> yes. so that's very yes. nice. And then, of course, um, advertising is what pays your bills, right? So here, it does. Uh, it does. Uh, well, you know what? I'll, I'll say advertising used to pay most of the bills. Um, right. These days, subscriptions pay a lot of the bills. Of course, that, that, that's true. So let's uh, put travel aside for a moment and just look at the rest of the paper. And I know you have uh, lots of colleagues who work on this. So uh, maybe for a moment, uh, talk about what it's like to be at the New York Times and how long you've been there and uh, what, what are the things you've seen change over your time there? Oh, so I've been at the Times um, almost 20 years. Um, <laughs> so I've been there quite a while. And I mean, the, the biggest change is the shift from um, being really print focused, um, you know, and having the web portion of our uh, coverage be kind of, you know, an add on at the very beginning to being digital first. And we really, you know, the whole like people kind of ask about, you know, a divide between print and digital. And the, the thing is that the whole paper really is digital first. Um, caring very much about print, but also like publishing online is our, you know, our first, the first way we publish and then print follows after that. And that used to be completely different. Um, and also, you know, especially lately, the shift to um, live coverage um, and our focus on really being you know, we're really a 24 hour news operation now because we hand off around the world, um, you know, from New York to Asia to London as the time difference changes. And we're really up and doing stuff 24 hours a day. And we really focus now on live coverage and bringing people live briefings. I don't know how many people, you know, say we're reading the Uvalde coverage, but we were there live and posting um, as we knew things and found things out. Yeah, the the idea that you have to wait for everything to be known before publishing, uh, you know, is is, is changing obviously. Yeah. So here here is also an interesting uh, 
way to play the Sunday section, right? The front Sunday cover is a little different, more analysis and, and things. And here you're seeing the story of what has happened, mass shooting since 2009. And a really interesting angle is this rifle maker, in particular, Daniel Defense, has been pushing limits to marketing to young people, but they also are now offering financing. A lot of gun manufacturers do that. So they, they're they doing marketing directly to kids and that's obviously uh, part of the problem here. And not to forget Buffalo. I think that was the decision that you're seeing reflected here. Uh, just a week ago, one life stolen, a whole family shattered. Buffalo massacre had many victims. As an editor at the Times, I think this is one of the ways in which journalism works is you try to tell a small, like an individual story to represent a larger issue or a larger story. Uh, this is this must be so, I know you didn't work on these stories in particular, but this is the way that the Times is evolving now, more analysis, more explanation in the print and more live breaking news, right? Is that? Yeah, no, I think that that's a, I think that's a fair assessment, yes. And uh, so, so upsetting to, to see all of this. Were you in the newsroom when the news came in about Uvalde? Um, I was, I'm trying to remember. I don't, no, I was at home. I was okay. At home. Oh. okay, I was just wondering what the atmosphere like there was, because it's just so happening so often now and and it, and it's so, and it's, and it's so upsetting. Let's, yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things is that most people are not in the newsroom right now. Right, so it's um, kind of, I think it's different because it's scattered. You know, people yeah. are working from home, most people. Sure. Um, so there's a small group in the newsroom. And then um, and the idea that we can do it that way is, is you know, fascinating to me because before it would have been like people everybody had to be together there. physically to talk about it. And now you can't do that. Across Russia, crowdsourcing to send basic aid to soldiers. So this is actually a story about you know, this is unusual, right? We've been seeing so much from the Ukraine side of uh, point of view and the soldiers and including Americans who are now there. And here's how they're sending stuff to uh, Russian soldiers. Obviously, I'm very interested in making sure they hear not the disinformation and misinformation from the Russian government. Uh, here's a, a story, much debate, but little dialogue about transgender female athletes. Another example of uh, lots of breaking news or news items about transgender sports. Uh, how do you analyze this? Um, I'm, I, I haven't read that piece yet. I am looking mm. forward to reading it. Um, and I think, I mean, I think it's an interesting issue uh, where, and it has really divided people in the sports world where, um, you know, women um, fought so long um, to, uh, for Title IX and to have parity in, um, in athletics, uh, how does transgender, uh, how do transgender athletes, how are they affected? How do they affect uh, what's going on? So I think it's really an, an interesting debate. And I know um, Michael has been writing about similar issues um, for a while. And I think it, it'll be an interesting read. Michael Powell, that's right. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, another example of the service journalism we see a lot in the Times here are four audiobooks to listen to now. Here to help is the, even the name of the section or this little item uh, is called Here to Help. And uh, uh, they're they're talking about uh, audiobooks to, yeah. uh, to listen to. Um, here is a Me Too stand against a serial seducer in France. And um, uh, this is about someone who's been accused of, of raping, uh, uh, who accused the news anchor of raping her. So this is very high profile, sort of what we've been through in in America as well. Here's an ad, gun violence is a public health crisis, a preventable one. I think that's the message that people need to hear about how much of this is in fact preventable. Ireland's front room is open for last book as renovations begin. There's the long room library, uh, which is going to the old library at Trinity College in Dublin will be closed to visitors beginning next fall. So uh, just look how lovely that is. I know, it's beautiful, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Fine-tuning a technique to ID Australia's missing. Uh, Russia closes in on complete control of an eastern province. Uh, yeah, you're seeing now Ukraine is not the front page news anymore, but uh, obviously the coverage still continues and journalists, including your colleagues, are risking their lives being there. Yes, they are. Yeah. 
uh, UN human rights chief tempers criticism of China's treatment of Muslims. Uh, so that's a story about what's happening with mi minorities in China. Here's a story about minorities in India and a movie called The Kashmir Files, which is made by a very right wing propagandist named Vivek Agnihotri, who writes the most um, angry um, anti-Muslim things online has now been endorsed by the government for his movie. In Los Angeles, threatened tree has roots in 1936 Olympics. So here's a story about a single tree that's being written about at the Times. Uh, can you reflect on this? Like, what does uh, how do, how do editors decide? You know, not you, you won't know this particular example, but the value of doing this kind of coverage and why it's important. Well, I, you know, I think I, I know this piece. Uh, I know the broad outlines of it, which is that there was an athlete, um, a black athlete from the um, Olympics, and uh, he was given this oak tree um, and planted it in his yard, and it has now um, it's now a, a you know a tall mighty oak, but it's endangered. Um, and I think these kinds of um, very close in stories that then open out to talk about issues, I think those can really help people understand um, issues. And, and by giving people this kind of lovely narrative to hook onto, you can introduce um, the broader uh, problems. And this is an international story because it's a German artist based in Vienna who is working to save the tree. And what a stunning photograph. Here is the athlete, Mr. Johnson, Cornelius Johnson, holding the tree sapling in his hand as he stands on the podium. What a stunning photograph and captures the story, as you were saying. And here, the coronavirus update, right? I still remember when they stopped doing it as, a, you know, uh, as highlighting it as a set, you know, an internal section. They just spread it all over the paper, basically, in the stories, right? That's what they did. Right. And that, uh, you know, on that page underneath the map is our backdoor getting into the United States story. So oh, here it is. That's right. Yeah. And uh, land border crossings like this between Canada and the U.S. do not require a coronavirus test. And uh, people will find the loopholes if you have them. They and will. And here's the treatment of the transgender athlete story and uh oh this is also interesting an entrepreneur of craft cocktails for bottle service with a smile in brooklyn park he's the man and uh and this is always big online manhattan henge oh uh, uh, yes and, yeah and this is when the sun lines up so that you can see it in uh the spectacular sunsets so may 29th is a uh, half sun at 8 13 and monday may 30th and this will happen again in july so it's good to see this is being tracked yeah uh, online and you're you're seeing that uh so much to get through in the paper as well uh and here's lots of coverage about guns in america uh and and uh here is here is a story about the here the obituary section. I'm a big fan of obituaries. How about you? Yeah, I think that often they are really really fascinating, and um, you know I think they uh, tell so many interesting stories and, and and just fascinating details about people's lives. Um, I am a definitely a reader of the obituaries. Have you had the chance to work on them or edit them or or? Uh... I have never worked uh, on the obits desk. The only thing I did, and I, I this was um, has been a really interesting effort uh, in recent years, is the um, we there was uh, a thing called the overlooked. It's overlooked no yes. more. Um, yes. And when we first published those, they did a um, a whole bunch of them at once, and we did a special section. Um, and I just helped out as an editor on those because I was so fascinated by the effort. And we had Amy Padnani, who uh, was part of that effort, uh, the editor, Obits editor of The Times, on our show a couple of years ago, and she was fantastic. Uh, yeah, she's a, yeah, she she um, uh, she's not the Obits ed editor. Uh, yep. Bill McDonald is, but she is an editor on the desk, uh, and um, she this was her idea, and it's so great, and it was so innovative and smart and. Uh, I'm a big admirer of Amy's. But yeah, just take a look. You know, we just saw Diane Arbus just fly by there. 
Uh, she is such a prominent photographer. Uh, her legacy is so important and that the Times would just not publish an, editor an obituary for her seems surprising, but they did overlook women, people, uh, minorities, things like that. Yep. And uh, sports section, we'll just glance here at uh, the Champions League, Real Madrid won yesterday. It was a big, big game and uh, lots of people, uh, they beat Manchester. And yeah, there was, there was I'm, big news. I'm not a, I'm not a soccer fan, so I'm but I know that was big news. I mean, people were it was all over Twitter yesterday. I actually am a hockey fan. So, um, so I'm looking my, for hockey for you to see if there's any hockey here. There is none. <laughs> um, so my big news was uh, the Rangers won last night and um, now we go to game seven. So I'm I've got my fingers crossed that we can actually win um, in yes. Raleigh, which we hey. haven't been able to do. Exciting. I still remember in 94 when they won ah. 40 something years. Uh, here's an unusual set of photographs. Veteran runners have advice for you. And 82 years old, 93 years old, 99 year wow. old Roy Engler and 90 year old. And uh, these are the kinds of things you find in the paper just sort of just pop up and uh, they're really nice. Uh, what can you tell us about the school of the New York Times? Uh, I have not been involved in that effort, but I know a lot of people are, and I think it, you know, I, uh, I went digital, you know, went virtual at the worst moments of the pandemic, but I think they're back in person this summer. Sure. Before we just glance at this uh, New York Times, very upsetting story about kids. I want to uh, look at this uh, happier story about kids, which is the New York Times for kids. Uh, they say this section should not be read by grownups. And Amber Williams, the editor, will be our guest next month on, on the show. Uh, we'd love to have everyone join us then. It's called The Tiny Issue. And uh, they, they have given us permission to post the PDF of this on digimentors.group digimentors.group till noon eastern time so another couple of hours uh, and then we'll be taking it off because this is a print only uh, publication but uh, amber uh, here you can see her editor's note uh, has given us permission to put it there so noon eastern time it'll disappear so grab it please at digimentors.group you can see so much love and work and effort goes into this and uh uh, look at this, your miniature menu and uh, snacks and sides and whoopie pies and the science. So much coverage here. It's uh, it's I'm always stunned by how how how, how great a job they do uh, with this. But, it's really fun, though. I don't yeah. think you and I are supposed to be reading. Exactly. That's why I, 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 I closed it as fast as I could. Yeah. But let's let's talk about the magazine. And as someone who's not in the magazine, your thoughts on it and its role within the paper. Uh, you know, I think it's always a, a great read on Sunday and, you know, something to dive into and, um, uh, you know, longer form narrative kind of uh, stories. I'm looking forward to reading this as well um, and kind of the fallout of the anti-vax over the coronavirus vaccines and whether that carries over. You know, that was already a growing movement. Yes. Um, and Led by Joe McCarthy, uh, not Joe McCarthy, sorry, Joe Kennedy, Joe, Joe okay. Kennedy yeah. uh, as bad a person. Uh, jo, uh, jo, uh, Joe, Joe, uh, this was RFK's son, R Robert yeah, it's F. Not Kennedy Joe, it's, Jr. Um, I'm Robert which, F. Kennedy Jr. Yes, yes we wanna, thank you. You want to get the you. right person, Robert up. F. Kennedy Jr. and Jenny McCarthy and people like that. And they've been mainstreamed over the pandemic. And that's what yeah. the story is about. You also uh, have, do you coordinate that voyages issue? And how does that work with the travel section? Uh, that's their um, effort. So um, that's their take on travel. So we operate separately. Okay. And Alex, Alex Cooper on the secret of her podcasting superstardom. She is the, we all know that Joe Rogan is the most popular podcaster in many, uh, you know, many metrics, but her podcast called Call Me Daddy is number two. And she says she's gunning for number one. They talk about sex and relationships on her show. It's called, again, Call Her Daddy. Uh, the ethicist section here, I witnessed a murder. Is it wrong to write about someone else's tragedy? We don't have time to put you on the spot. Uh, to ask you the answer for this, but uh, he, uh, Kwame Anthony Apaya, Professor Apaya, gets such fascinating letters, and he's been doing this for a long time now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, more service journalism. There's a tip here, how to help 
uh, your pet Sue the Stranger, letter recommendation, learning to live with ghosts. These are again things that are different from the times, you know, when you join the kinds of things that they used right. to have here. The diagnosis. I'm actually, you're, you're skipping over it, but I am a big fan of the diagnosis column. Please, please talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always just think it's fascinating, you know, like people, uh, I, I love the thinking and how people go about um, actually how the doctors actually go about diagnosing what sure. is wrong with people and sort of so many times it's like there's an element of chance to it that you just like hit upon the right person mm -hmm. or they just happen to have, you know, seen this case before. I, I'm fascinated. I love well, medical history. I, I hope you've told Dr. Sanders how much you love it. <laughs> she, I, you know, she doesn't work in the office, so I, I actually <laughs> never met her, but um, she's at, I believe she's at Yale. Right. Um, so this, I don't know if she listens, but this is my chance <laughs> to say, I think you're doing a great job. Awesome. Uh, chocolate biscotti spiked with chilies uh, possess the power to persuade even the staunchest doubters. So this is the eat column, the recipes, the pen and the sword, Ukrainian novelist Andrei Kurkov finds imaginative incitement is a real reality, so absurd as to defy satire and uh, Ukrainian army checkpoint. And then here's that story, the anti-vax movement and its new frontier. Just, just look at Look at this, uh, so upsetting that this is happening in America. And it won't just affect the kids of, that they have, it'll affect the population as we know, immunity and things are affected by this. And there is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, his own family has had to criticize him so many times. The rise and fall of the ELF, America's militant environmentalist underground. This is an interesting story because as we know, they there were people doing extremist you know terrorist stuff uh, attacking uh, arsons thing are uh, things like that and now as the world has become more in danger with the environmental crisis that movement has evolved and is changing are you a puzzler i am but i have shifted i have actually done that puzzle already I um, shifted to doing it on my phone. I'm obsessed. <laughs> I, I do. I, you know, I shouldn't admit how much time I spend doing these things, but I do the spelling bee every day. Um, I do uh, the crossword every day. And then I have gotten into the Wordle. I'm not quite as much a Wordle fanatic yet. but. Um, and it's yeah. made a difference to the New York Times bottom line, as they've said, the number of subscribers yeah, absolutely. and all of that. I absolutely. have, I'm the only person maybe listening to the show or on the show who has not never done a Wordle. Ah. Uh, yeah. But I can solve one puzzle here, one item on the crossword puzzle, 112 Sanskrit for great soul. Ah, I got that. I don't know yeah, if we should tell people. Well, we'll give them one clue. That's a clue. There are so many. Uh, Mahatma is the answer there. And, and I'm going to jump up for a second because mm -hmm. a Alarm is or a uh, timer is going off in my house. <laughs> sure, yeah, because <laughs> I'm getting ready for my Memorial Day picnic. <laughs> yes, and Joe, uh, please go ahead and do that. Yeah, uh, folks, here we're talking to Amy Vership. We have about 15 minutes with her. If you have any questions about uh, anything to do with travel or the New York Times, please ask. Uh, type in your question, and if you're joining us late, we are live on these channels now: Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn, and we'll be back. A lie, uh, the recording will play as soon as we're off the air. So please tag a friend. This has been such a great conversation with Amy already. And we'd love to hear your thoughts about travel, any questions you have. And please do get in touch with us. You see my email address right on the screen and Neil Parikh as well. This is an example of the work we do at DigiMentors. This is not your regular webinar. And we'd love to work with your organization to do a hybrid event, a virtual event, uh, consulting. This is uh, a, a, an example of the kind of work we do. We're so proud of our team at DigiMentors. And don't forget to grab uh, at digimentors.group uh, uh, today's New York Times for Kids PDF. It'll only be there till noon Eastern time. And uh, you can see all the things that we do at our company, social and digital consulting, virtual and hybrid events, and uh, event amplification, talk shows, podcasts. And we'd love to make one of these for you, training and workshop. So please do check that out. Uh, Amy is back at Amy Versha. Please follow her 
on Twitter and uh, check out uh, all, all the things that we've been talking about. Uh, tell us about your movie interests. Um, you know, I love going to the movies and that's something I really hope comes back um, in our post pandemic stage. The thing that I really wanna see right now is um, everything everywhere all at once. I haven't seen it yet. So I'm, uh, that's on my list of things to go see in the movie theater. Well, what about um, Mr. Tom Cruise and his uh, his Top Gun Part Two? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the fence. I have to read about it and see what I think. Uh, I think we have a review, um, so I will go and, and give. It I, I think we're all going to be more picky about the movies, right? Because it's such an effort to go see a film now that maybe we'll have higher standards about what we will see. Though I do want to see that film. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess just to admire, oh, here it is the need for speed and there preparation. We go. There uh, we go. Just the, how he looks so young after all of these years is, <laughs> is amazing. Yes, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> A time to emerge from the setbacks. This is uh, this is about Journey Smollett has new projects, uh, and uh, this is you remember the hoax that was done by Jesse Smollett. Yep. And uh, this is the new It guy. Uh, Austin Butler never heard of him, and he's playing Elvis, and so that's a lot of pressure. Uh, he ain't nothing but Elvis Presley. Yes. Uh, I, I've seen the trailer for that. I haven't seen the movie yet. And it's a Baz Luhrmann film. We know everything he does is over the top. So Exactly. And look at that these listings. like it's so very many. over the top. Yeah, there's all these. Well, Elvis maybe deserves over the top, so that's okay. And here are... Geopolitics are dark and cold. Borgen, an acclaimed Danish series, returns with a focus on the crisis in Greenland. So lots to read about. This is the uh, arts and leisure section. The real estate cover is about how hard it is to find apartments in New York City. Uh -huh. and, and this very powerful use of uh, the same sentence again and again in different crises where the gunman was able to obtain the weapon legally and how many people have died. Yeah. I mean, you know, as I said before, we're all we all publish digitally first, um, but I think there's so much power uh, sometimes in in print um, design and the way information is conveyed in print. That I, I, you know, I have my print paper here too. So <laughs> that's that's great. And uh, and Neil saying that Sunday Review cover is incredible. It really uh, is is stand out. And here's Maureen Dowd talking to the founder, okay, co-founder of Netflix. Uh, how many streaming channels do you subscribe to? Oh, too many, <laughs> too many. <laughs> All right, uh, here is uh, Ellen DeGeneres' Bittersweet Farewell. She was at the top of the world and because of toxic work environment, uh, she is you know, basically out of a show. And, uh, and uh, by the way, we had Daniel Jones, the editor of Modern Love, on our show and we loved having him he runs the podcast and the column and all of all of that it's fascinating to read including the tiny love stories yeah those are fun and i love the social cues column by Philip. me too i'm a and, big fan uh, so all right so, <laughs> so i am going to put you on the spot we have just enough time to do this again no right or wrong answer as you uh -oh, know, I, I have the answer to... social cue i'm not sure i'm as as wise as philip yeah, I don't think any of us are, but let's talk about this. After a long search, I found a great roommate. The space is tight, so someone neat and respectful is important. I'm a woman, and I was slightly surprised that the best candidate was a man. We have many shared interests, so our conversations are interesting. We even cook together. The problem, sometime late at night, I hear sounds of porn coming from his bedroom. That grosses me out. Would it be too much to ask him not to watch it while I'm at home? Um, your thoughts? <laughs> um, well, I think... <laughs> that's a hard conversation to have, but I think she needs to have that conversation. And I guess one of the questions would be, what if he just put his headphones on and didn't have the um, sound coming out <laughs> yes. um, so that she could hear it? I don't, what does, what does Philip say? So he says, ask him to use headphones. See, oh there he is. <laughs> I'm brilliant. <laughs> yes, exactly. Ask him to use headphones when he's watching films or listening to music when you're both in the apartment. You should do the same. If you want to keep your roommate, I suggest putting what he does in the privacy of his bedroom, uh, butting out of what he does in the privacy of his bedroom, as long as it's invisible and inaudible to you. It's none of your business. So that's, that's interesting. By the way, I've always wondered, you know, in this and the ethicist, 
even though there are no names revealed, if if I was this guy, I would know this is me because oh, yeah, of the absolutely. way this is described. But absolutely. people still do it. This is the power of the New York Times. People want an answer. And I haven't yeah. read the O'Dowd call, uh, the Maureen Dowd column yet, but I uh, look forward to doing that. And this is uh, the successor to the Bill Cunningham work. The we used to see we read that all the time and uh-huh. uh, yep. yeah. And uh, we also like looking, people love reading this, and this is an example of uh, how this has changed over the years, right? Now they're same-sex couples, they are uh, min- uh, people of color in, in ways, you know, 40, 50 years ago wouldn't have been the case. Yeah, no, it used to be much more, you know, who you were socially yeah. in New York, um, and now it's really evolved. Yeah. So we we have about 10 minutes left with Amy Vershop. If you have any questions or comments, please jump in and post them. We will bring uh, out some of the co- questions that people have been asking already. Uh, Amy, tell us about uh, how you're uh, how you're looking at uh, the way you're going to evolve the coverage of the times in, in travel. What are your plans? You mentioned that a little bit earlier, but it'd be here interesting for people who missed that at the beginning. Um, You know, we're hoping to get back to some of our more, um, you know, quote unquote, normal coverage of doing destination pieces of telling people, you know, great trips that they can go on and um, how to, you know, how to navigate the world and and wonderful things to see because it's so rich. Um, You know, we also um, continue to try to look at the issues that are uh, uh, arise around travel. We know that travel doesn't happen in a vacuum. So, uh, you know, a reader asked earlier about climate, and we are definitely focused on the climate issue and uh, travel's effect. Other issues of, what you know, sustainable travel, um, how local communities are affected, Are you, is, where's your money going when you travel? Um, we look at that. We like to think also about uh, diversity in travel, how women can travel, how, uh, you know, Blacks, um, other, you know, Black travelers, Hispanic travelers, wh- whoever, um, you know, we really believe that travel belongs to everyone, but that sometimes people hit um, roadblocks and we want to address that and try to look at those issues um, of diversity in travel too. Thank you. Those are great topics uh, to be covered in the in in the travel coverage of of the times. We're going to take a little time out and uh, give you a chance to uh, catch your breath. We're going to come back to you with a couple of questions that have come in, and then we'll wrap up. Neil and I will just chat and preview what's coming up in in the weeks ahead. So thank you so much, folks. That's Amy Versha. Please follow her at Amy V I R S H U P on Twitter. Neil, uh, this has been an awesome show already. And we still have a few minutes left with her. Absolutely. Uh, what a great uh, time. Again, folks should know that we actually didn't plan to do a show on the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. We only did it because Amy agreed to be on the show to talk about the summer of cycling and mm-hmm. all things travel as well. But what a great special section. Again, the PDF is on our website. Uh, so I really encourage folks to check it out. The uh, video, the the, the uh Italy to Trieste to to Croatia bike ride is on our website as well. There's a gift link uh, so you can check it out. That's the one they did special treatment for uh, compared to the other articles. Uh, What a great show, Sri. And great to have you back in the uh, in the big chair. Yeah, no, I'm I'm so happy to be here and I missed all of you and uh, so great to see familiar names watching and new people watching as well from around the world. And big thanks to Paula Kiger on our team for all the work that you and her do together every week to make this possible. So give us a sense of who's coming up in the, uh, the next few weeks and then we'll bring Amy back. Absolutely. So next week, we're going to be kicking off a Pride uh, for June. Uh, Mark King, uh, an award-winning blogger, author, speaker, and HIV AIDS activist, will be joining us. Uh, he's been uh, he tested positive for HIV in 1985, uh, so he'll talk about uh, his journey. He also was uh, journal- named Journalist of the Year by the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association uh, in 2020. Uh, and fun fact, he won a car on The Price Is Right 
uh, <laughs> back in like 1980 or something. Um, so that's that's going to be an interesting story he'll share. Uh, in June, uh, you mentioned earlier that Amber Williams will be joining us at the end of the month to talk about New York Times for Kids. I'm so thrilled that she'll be on the show. Uh, but we also have Tom Jolly returning. Tom Jolly is the print editor of the New York Times. And uh, we um, first uh, met him at his house. We did a show in the before times uh, at his uh, uh, kitchen table looking at the print edition of the New York Times. And then he With the print us. editor of the New York Times. That was amazing. I mean, and, and I should point out that we would not have typically done a show on Father's Day, but the dads get to decide what they, how they spent their Father's <laughs> Day. And he, he volunteered to do it. And the two of us... I yeah. uh, love doing the show, and uh, and so I guess that's our prerogative that we can do a Father's Day episode with the with the print editor of the New York Times. And I want to do a special shout out to Tom and the art director Wayne Camadoy. Uh, ever since you know, I reached out to him uh, that week. You know, I think it was like a Tuesday. <laughs> sent him a, a tweet. You know, uh, I sent him a DM. By Sunday, he was on the show. I mean, he was he's been so <laughs> generous, and he and Wayne have been great in terms of sharing content a heads up on special sections, uh, helping to promote the show, very generous with their Twitter accounts. So really, thank you. What a great partnership we have with them. Of course, we're not an official part of the New York Times. We have a great relationship with the Times. Uh, you know, having Amy on the show this week is another example of that. Uh, but it, it's been such a great symbiotic relationship. Uh, it really has been great. And we do occasionally do other cities and other newspapers, yes. the Washington Post, Chicago Sun-Times, Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Toronto Globe and Mail. Uh, we've the done Philadelphia, in Philadelphia, Philadelphia Inquirer, Inquirer as well. So much, yeah. Oh. So let's bring Amy back and just say to you, Neil, thank you for everything you do. And uh, big thanks to our sponsors at Muckrack and our team, including Paula Kiger for uh, being here with us every Sunday. So Amy, welcome back. Uh, Great to have you with us. Thank you for your time with us. Uh, just a couple of questions before we go. Uh, okay. Question from Miles Rose asking, uh, what do you recommend for researching website or what websites or tools do you recommend for travel? Well, I hope the New York Times travel section <laughs> would be one of them. Uh, you know, we're, we have a lot of content. Um, I, you know, I think, um, there's a site called Culture Trip that I like. They have a, a lot of interesting um, Culture pieces. Trip, T-R-I-P. Culture Trip. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, I, in terms of like searching for fairs and things like that, I tend to use Kayak a lot. I hate to, you know, I don't really want to endorse one thing or another. Um, and, but um, those are helpful. They and some other sites, Amy, tell you, are the prices going to go up in these dates versus other days? And that's helpful because they're not always 100% accurate, but you get the directionally, of course, now everything just moving up. Yes, but the arrow within is Within a week, even, even within a week, there can be changes on the day of the week that you buy, that you're traveling, as you know. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and then f finally, any, any, any tips for folks as they are planning their summers now, if they feel, my God, it's too late, is there anything I can do? What would you say to them? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I do think the one thing is to think about your timing, maybe go a bit later. Um, as I said earlier on the show, after the middle of August, things do fall off a little bit because uh, families are going back to school. September is a great time to travel. Um, so, you know, if you don't have to go at the very, very height of things, don't go um, and think about alternate uh, destinations as well. Maybe not the if you really have to go in that window, maybe not the most popular place, but um, other, uh, you know, things that are similar that you could visit. Yeah, that's 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 great uh, advice. Uh, Diana said New York Times with kids is the best. I look at it despite the warning. It is amazing joining you from D.C. And she says about you, Amy, amazing guest. And no, Diana you. usually watches from California at 530 in the morning. So she's in D.C. time to this time so she can watch. Uh, speak of D.C., Debbie Burnick says thank you, Amy, for getting us geared up to travel again. Jonathan says great program. Amy is always a wonderful guest and uh, just so, so nice to see all of these comments. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And a big thanks to Amy for being here. We'll see you next Sunday, 8.30 a.m. Eastern. And you can watch Amy's 
entire show as soon as we're off the air in just a couple of seconds here now. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.